Hello everybody, welcome to Into the Prey, breaching the chaos of the church with Nick and Mary Franks. Mary is here with me. We're here today at quite a special location. If you've seen the DreamWorks film Brave, you may recognise where we are. We're at Donata Castle and we're going to have another seismically important conversation. This time, as a follow-on from last week's podcast, we're going to be talking about Sweet. Uh, well, a range of things, mainly related to the book uh, ec- ec- Ecumenism, another gospel. Yeah, we're going to show you the book. We're going to talk about ecumenicalism. We're going to talk about the Alpha Course. So stay tuned. <laughs> So here we are, this is Donata Castle. If you've never seen it, if you're in the Aberdeen area, it's worth coming to have a little look at. We're not gonna go into it today. There's like a little path down there and you can go up into the actual castle. We're just gonna see it from a distance. But yeah, Donata Castle, welcome. This is a really unusual intro to the podcast today because once again the Scottish weather and particularly the wind has meant we couldn't use our equipment so we've had to lie our tripod down on the grass and and just do this for a little bit. But we'll we'll give you a brief intro here and then we'll take the conversation back into the warmth of a coffee shop and have a coffee. But what what we're going to do today is talk about this book that I featured in the podcast a few days ago by E.S. Williams, and the title is Ecumenism, Another Gospel, or Ecumenicalism, Another Gospel. And what we're going to do in the podcast, this pod vlog, I should say, today, is explain that um, in specific regard to the Alpha Course. Virtually everybody listening to this now will have heard of the Alpha Course. Nicky Gumbel, Holy Trinity Brompton, a.k.a. HTB, Worship Central, etc. I grew up. Mm. I grew up and went to university in London at the time that Nicky Gumbel's Alpha Course was beginning to explode and go global. I had friends who were at the Alpha Course and became Christians and are still following and loving Jesus today. So we want to talk about that, but we want to be honest in what... I think what this book helps us to see about the true reality Mm. of ecumenicalism Mm -hmm so-called ecumenism, another gospel, how does that affect Billy Graham, John Stott, the things that I talked about in the podcast last week, but we're going to talk in specific regard with a coffee about the disaster of the Alpha Course. We're now inside and we've come to Acosta for the reasons given. (laughs) This is the book that we want to show you. It's by somebody called E.S. Williams and there is a caveat that we'll come to um, about E.S. Williams and about the church that E.S. Williams is from because they're cessationists and we want to, we're not making slight of that. It's major. Um, But anyway, the book is Ecumenism, Another Gospel. Um... Well, do you want to just get, because the reason we're doing this today is not to go into the depth of what of the book as a whole. That's what I've done in the podcast last week. Um, but it might be helpful for people to hear your thoughts on it, because they've not heard your, any of your thoughts on it. On the book, generally? Yeah. So, um, it is a real eye-opener when you read this book, because I think 
I wasn't prepared for, um, I think the, the ecumenical stuff that happens across the church at the moment is pretty well known. So I'm, I wasn't really surprised by that leaning of it. I think what I was surprised by was the level of ecumenicalism that ha was happening with the Catholic Church. I was really quite... You mean, you mean the, the, the kind of cooperation with yeah. the, between the Anglican or the Evangelicals and the Catholics? Yeah. I was really surprised <coughs> by how happy, seemingly, Billy Graham was in particular to, <clears throat> to really embrace that. Mm -hmm. And to me that just seems so odd for somebody who was apparently so well known in terms of evangelism um, it's just quite shocking really but mm -hmm. I think what's quite interesting in the way that this book has been written is it's been broken down into really helpful short chapters but that has pinpointed mm -hmm. lots yeah. of areas to think about yeah. and it raises lots of problems and then take the guy goes very clearly through the issues with it and I think when you see it this way, you realise just how much... Wait a second, the guy's very kindly given us some coffees here because we were foolish enough to forget our phone and wallets. So, thank you very much. Costa Coffee. Thanks again for doing that, mate. Thank you. So that's what happens when you forget a cost of coffee. If you forget your wallet and your coffee, they're kind enough to trust you that you'll come back in and pay later, which I think is really good. <laughs> it's really good. Sorry, what you're saying is much more important. Uh, yes, just that he highlights several... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Several key issues with the Lausanne Covenant. But when you go through them, you, you see how these have infiltrated lots of different areas of the Christian church and organization. So when you th he's relating it specifically to these things, but you can really see the way that it's played out mm. across denominations, across parachurch organizations. And you can see, especially when you go to read like faith statements or those kind of things, where sometimes it feels a bit fuzzy or you can't quite pinpoint what people are actually saying or, or the fact that they don't mention things. And it feels mm. this helps to explain, I think, where so many, so many people have been affected by the kind of lazy fare. Mm -hmm. Anybody who says they're this, it must be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, we can just... You know that's fine. We can just go with that. So I, I think the book's really helpful in just walking you through these different things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would recommend it as a read for lots of people. Yeah, it was a real eye opener, and we're grateful to have heard from several people since my longer, more in depth podcast. Sorry for spraying Mary with a little bit of milk there. I was I was a bit Ainsley Harriet for anybody in the UK will know who he is. But Ainsley Harriet with the milk and the coffee there. Uh, we've been very grateful to have heard from a few people since the more in-depth podcast and please do listen to that um, just to say that they've got the book and that they're working through it and that it's been, been an eye-opener so I, I, want to, I want to push this and promote this as far and as wide as possible with the caveat that it's written by a cessationist and we're going to try and deal with that a little bit today and we'll do a separate follow-on it might be the next pod vlog we'll do about cessation but this is the book okay Ecumenism, another gospel, T.S. Williams, not T.S. Eliot, T.S. Williams. And as Mary's saying, it's not long, it's only like 150 pages. You can read it in a day easily. Um, and the chapters, there's 12 chapters, as I read out on the podcast. And it's just very concise. It's not difficult to read. It, you might want to do it with your somebody, a friend or your spouse or... Um, I don't know, it's, it's accessible. And the author, T.S. Williams, um, for many years was a consultant of, I think, public health in London, in Croydon. And, you know, so he's a very capable, professional man. He's a doctor, and it reads as such. It's concise, 
it's not waffly and so anyway I'm, re I'm recommending on multiple levels but the chapters are 12 chapters and the one that we want to deal with now in, in this conversation today is chapter um, 8 ecumenical alpha I, su I suppose for the benefit of people who might not have heard the podcast and again please don't watch this instead of the podcast because I do I do go into quite a lot of depth about um, just uh, more detail that we'll go into today about things more generally and particularly how the the Lausanne movement and so-called covenant had an immediate context of um, things going on in the Catholic Church, which, as Mary has just said, is is a kind of crucial, intimate part of this today. Um, so don't don't watch this instead of that. Um, but the the Alpha course is a focus of Chapter Eight. Now, I I wouldn't have said that the Alpha course was sound before knowing about this ecumenical stuff. I mean, just uh, sorry, I was just saying, wasn't I? The ecumenical. What does that word even mean? If you're not sure, basically the attempt as a virtue to be embracing of lots of different denominations regardless of what those denominations stand for, believe, proclaim and preach and teach as being true. Ecumenicalism is this kind of tension of, for, for the sake of so-called unity, of holding all things together, um, which, if you stop and think about it, can't possibly be of God because it includes holding lots of contradictory, opposing, mutually exclusive things together, and it's not even even close to being godly. Um, so that's what ecumenical means. That's what we're challenging today. And a big part of that is the Alpha Course. Now, before before this book, we, we wouldn't have said, oh, yeah, the Alpha Course is great, for one of the main reasons that we're just about to go into. We're going to go into the two reasons that Williams concludes his chapter on the Alpha Course as to why it's not mm -hmm. faithful. Um, but as you're saying, and as some other people who, since the podcast I've done last week, have expressed, it is an eye-opener mm -hmm. that it's not just that it's inadequate because it's not in-depth enough or it's inadequate because it's too seeker-sensitive, and it is all of that. It's actually... The revelation, I think, the eye-opener for me has been that because of the, the kind of in, the e, the kind of entwinedness of HTB, Nicky Gumbel, John Stott, Billy Graham, with Rome, with the Pope, with the Catholics, with with Catholicism as the driving strategic force behind the Alpha Course, that's an eye-opener for me. And because I've never been an Anglican, I've never been denominational really as a person, and neither of you, we wouldn't necessarily have known that about Nicky Gumbel. Um, Nicky Gumbel has always appeared to me as one of these guys who's kind of been a previous lawyer, He's, and then went to was it St. Melitus, and then come out as a vicar, and then ended up being right-hand man to Sandy somebody, what's his name? Sandy forget his name somebody can tell me um but you know just listening to Nicky Gumbel it was always like are you for real it's just like the, the kind of he's not a man's man do you know what I mean it's just it's always quite just kind of quite how would you sum it up if, if, if you're Inspector yeah a bit Anglican exactly if you're Inspector Grimm who by the way is my favorite comic character of all time Inspector Grimm off the Thin Blue Line, um, written by Ben Elton. It's just an absolutely brilliant guy. What would, what would Inspector Grimm say about Nicky Gumbel? Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm not going to do an impression. I might put a quick photo in here so you can see who I mean. But listen, I'm not being unkind or ungracious. Nicky Gumbel is not the kind of guy that's ever made me want to listen to what he's got to say, even when I've been listening to his over the, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, listening to the, the alpha videos, that, the talks, the original talks that he did. Um, so anyway, all that to say, it, it's just this kind of like, gosh, he said so explicitly mm. to, uh, about this thing about embracing Catholics. Because what's the quote? Because let's keep the main thing the main thing. We need to stop disagreeing. I mean, read the book yourself, and he's quoted in there a couple of times in this chapter. You know, so I think it's been that eye opener that it is so, so affected and controlled. By, by Rome mm. that the implications of this are far reaching and quite mm. shocking aren't they mm -hmm. definitely do you want to just say something quickly and then I can about your experience of Alpha 
out the Alpha course? Actually, I don't have any experience of the Alpha course. Look at this. I know. What, co- I thought that big, was a big coffee, regular one. Um, I have never actually myself done the Alpha course, and I've never. We we were only briefly part of it at church where we attended as kind of support people, if you remember. Yeah, that, that, that's the way it's run, isn't it? I can't remember yeah. what Alpha stands for, but there's an, P, it's the an P acronym. is for, like, pastor and... Yeah, so you go along yeah. and you eat food yeah. and then there's the thing and then there's, like, a group chat on a table. So I think the only time I've been along to it was a couple of sessions or so with a group thing like that where we were sat on a table with people who were going through it. My only memory of it is that it did feel quite light. I don't remember thinking this is, this is going to be hugely helpful. Mm-hmm. I know I've I've read a bit of the other one. Do you know there's Christianity another Christianity Explored, explored and that's yeah. quite different. That's yeah. a very different... Well, we don't know enough about it to, to vouch for that either, do we? No, no, but I remember it being a kind of different mm-hmm. sort of ethos about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the Alpha just feeling a bit light um, type thing so yeah that's really only my my only experience of alpha um, but obviously just it's very it's widespread and it's everywhere it doesn't really matter what denomination you're in most churches embrace having an alpha course and using that as part of their church kind of year thing don't they yeah they slap bad girl's name on a marketing campaign and think that's kosher um, I have I've been involved in running several Alpha courses over the years. Um, I'm a little bit older than Mary. I'm five years older than Mary, but the, the the main difference being probably is that I was an actual university student in London um, from 1999 to 2002. So it was it was late 90s, early 2000s when the Alpha course was really just coming to the fore. Oh, I can't remember the year that Nikki Gumbel launched it. It was mid-90s, I think. I 98. 98, was it? Yeah. Anyway, so I've been involved. People that we know, like my parents I know, who've, have been very involved in leading it. And maybe that's just an interesting point to make on the side, that, it, you know, the Alpha course, the contents of it, depending on who runs the Alpha mm. course, I mean, there, it doesn't matter how good the people are, like my mum and dad, you know, high quality people that you know if they if they would effectively have had to have supplemented the con- the content yeah. so you know the the, the it's just, we're not we're not we're not throwing out the all of the alpha course in the sense that well you know we are we're, we're rejecting it because half a truth is no truth at all and you can't support the alpha course just because it works well around dinner tables and so yeah. on. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that if you have high-quality people who are switched on and understand mm. the deficiency of some things, yeah. it may have not been as bad. Mm. But nevertheless, the structure of it... <coughs> bless you. The, the structure of it is what it is. Um, and so anyway, all I'm, all I'm trying to say is that I've, I've seen high-quality people lead them and there will have been some fruit. I'm going to touch on that in a minute. I, um, for example, some friends of mine who became Christian disciples during university, I was blessed enough to see that um, one friend every year of my three years in London. And two of them, I'm trying to think, yeah, two of them would have been involved in an alpha course with me. Now, both of those guys are still, as far as I can tell, committed to Christ. I don't know either of them, not close to either of them, but I just did a quick Google um, search on them, and from what I could see, one um, one guy and his wife, Ben and Emily, if, you, if you're watching, welcome. Um, I doubt you are, but anyway, th- those guys, from what I could see, were in like a, a kind of, I would call a compromised church context, egalitarian, seeker-sensitive, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Another guy, a good friend of mine, he was a, he was a closer friend of mine called John. John Hammond, if you're watching, mate, I hope you got my email this week. He and his wife, Leanne, are now missionaries in Zambia. Just quality. I remember I've got great memories of John in Soul Survivor. That's a whole other story. Gosh. But you can just make, so you just make the point. Like, HTB, 
um, Soul Survivor, Mike Pilavachi, Tim Hughes, all of that. Anyway, I've got great memories of being in a tent with John during Soul Survivor and having deep and meaningful conversations about the scripture. Yeah. You know, John was a new Christian. And he, I remember having conversations with him about, about what Jesus meant when he was talking about you can't, you know, if you if you don't renounce all for me, you can't, you know, you, if, if you don't hate your mother and father. And I remember that conversation so clearly, like just John saying to me, "What does this mean? How can Jesus mean this?" Da, da, da. And just so, the, so what, what the reason I'm mentioning those examples from the Alpha Course is to make the, make this important point is that God will still have saved people through it. There is a mystery to some of this because, as we're about to show you, it's a false gospel. And I think this does touch on the on the whole caveat about cessationism. Yeah. The guy, the, yes, Williams wants to make the point that the when he talks about the Holy Spirit away day, that it's not the Holy Spirit that people were being introduced to, and I think that's a wrong thing to say. Mm-hmm. I think it's too sweeping. I understand what he's saying that in some contexts there's this. Yeah. This whole thing of feel like you know it's if if you're not teaching solid doctrine and scripture, then you're naive to think that spiritual times are always holy. Yeah. That's probably a good way of putting yeah, it. That's, yeah. You know, but to say that it wasn't the Holy Spirit mm, that people were being introduced to is is manifestly not true either. Which is why we're we're reading this and promoting it, but with a cri- a critic a critical read. It's uh, not as in negative, but as in thinking. being dis- being discerning and thinking. So these two guys, um, and I remember, I remember John, again, if you happen to be watching, mate, I remember, because the, the Holy Spirit away day was in Rod Stewart's old house, believe it or not, randomly in London, in this big old house, and I remember John being affected, I, I remember John just being touched by the Holy Spirit, and, you know, he's still a missionary, you know, he, he loves Jesus, you know, he's saved, so, yeah. but what we want to do with that said, with that caveat, number of caveats, T.S. William, e. Williams is a cessationist, but also this thing that some people will have been saved mm-hmm. through the Alpha Course. It's important that we come to the nuts and bolts of this now, and just just in you know just in a few minutes, what I'm going to do is just tell you what um, the two main issues were from this guy's perspective. And he's absolutely right. We're not arguing with this at all. This is absolutely right. And the, but probably the easiest way is if I just read this to you. Um, Nicky Gumbel's method of teaching the gospel fits perfectly with the Low Sun campaign for world evangelization. But there are two major problems with the Alpha Course. So this is how he concludes the chapter on the Alpha Course. Now, he has expressed his cessationist theology in this chapter as I was just touching on about his attitude towards the Holy Spirit. But it fascinated me, and I felt very encouraged by the fact that he concludes this chapter on the Alpha Course by not and, and the problems and, and why he's rejecting it, but there's no reference to the Holy Spirit and his mm. rationale for that. That encourages me because the Holy Spirit has not ceased giving gifts cessationism is a lie from the from the pit of hell it's a false doctrine but we agree that the vast majority of the charismatic world is false it, and has been abusive in its abuse of the gifts and it, and skewed in its teaching and in its practices so we agree and we disagree but i found it encouraging that there was no reference yeah, exactly. to the holy spirit there was no cessationist Argument yeah. in why he was dismissing mm-hmm. the two reasons he gives. Rather, firstly, that it, it presents a flawed, compromised view of the gospel of truth. It fails to describe the holy character of God. It fails to describe the sinfulness of sin. That's what you're talking about, the lightness of it. It doesn't teach, it doesn't help people to convert based on an understanding that they are totally depraved, that they need to repent of sin. Um, what is sin? Mm. Um, it fails to call sinners to mm. true repentance and leads to salvation through faith. Doesn't always do that. The danger, and this is really in telling, that the danger is that nominal Alpha Christians who have not truly repented of their sin, who have not truly turned to Christ in saving faith and been soundly converted, are being added to church congregations. There's a weight to this that requires like just like a pause, even in a conversation. 
The Bible tells us that we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. This is a strategy of Satan, is to populate compromised churches with so-called Christian disciples who haven't understood the gospel because they've not been taught it. And I, again, I'm speaking from personal experience of being at a mega church in Bradford for 10 years and seeing so-called thousands of people coming forward. And I don't know how many of them understood the gospel yeah. because the gospel wasn't preached yeah. or taught. So, the, his, so his first of two reasons was that, is that it's a false gospel and inadequate. And the second is that Alpha is deeply ecumenical in its approach, and this is where the shocking expose of unity, what they call unity with Rome, um, is, is the seedbed of all this, is this Roman Catholic agenda to essentially take over the evangelical world, to reverse the, Protest the Protestant Reformation. Um, do you want to do, can you remember that little bit in Joel that we read? Just give a quick hypothetical scenario. Do you remember what I was saying about that? Because because this is this is the way we'll finish this conversation now. We read Joel just this week, earlier this week, and there's a there's a bit in there where there's like a, we had an eclipse obviously this all the Americans did had an eclipse this week. Can you remember it? Yeah, so we Joel. I want to say it's near the end of Joel, but I could have that wrong. And in the passage, it speaks about a cosmic cosmic event, so something, a big natural event anyway, that causes people to basically cry out to God. And the thought was, that you had specifically about this, was that in the... But in the bit in Joel, it specifically says, and I'll put this on the screen so you can find it directly, and re please read the passage, don't just listen to us butcher it. But there's the bit where God says that God will give, basically God would save some of those who are witnessing these cosmic events. Oh, yes. So, yeah, so that's... So then I posed a hypothetical yeah, scenario. That if there was this kind of event that happened... Which there will be. Which there will be, and the type of thing that was seen this week was the, the eclipse, that in, in that moment that people think about God, which I think is quite natural for a lot of people to do that in those moments... Yeah. Where, where are these people going to hear the true gospel, the full gospel, not a light... Not an alpha gospel. Ed, exactly, a light edited version. Mm -hmm. And that's the main concern, that in the moment of real crisis that people have, that there isn't actually somewhere to go, somewhere to really hear it, or worse, that they go somewhere and hear a half-truth about who God is and what the gospel is and how you get saved. And, you know, in, in Lausanne's own words, something like 85% of the South American yeah. church embrace their covenant, which means 85% of the South, Amer uh, South American church are receiving a false gospel, which means, well, the consequences are huge. And, of course, that doesn't mean, as you've said, that people don't get saved and that God can't use things. We don't mean that. We just mean the risk is really high that people think they're saved when they're actually not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the scenario I was wanting us to think, to, to think about now is imagine there being an end of the age event in our lifetime. So Jesus comes or events running up to that and there is a, a mass turning and people are, you see in the book of Acts, you know, crying out, what do I need to do to be saved? And people are asking that question genuinely. What do I need to do to be saved? And all these unchurched, unsaved people, so unchurched, never heard the gospel, never been to church, no, and they're turning to people who are being called Christians or who are looking to people who are going in and out of these buildings that we call churches to look for the answer. But they're not able to give the answer because they themselves have not been taught the gospel. In many cases, it might be they're not even saved. And I think that is a... I think that is a, a genuine reality in and amongst the seeker-sensitive church. I really do. Um, so it just struck me when we read it from Joel this week because of this eclipse mm. and the scenes that we'd seen from America, Mexico, wherever else, of people who were obviously... You can't see a total eclipse and not be affected. You can't... Your mind can't be lifted above the normal plane of things for 
you know, even if it's for a few seconds or minutes. But in those moments, what would happen? And, you know, I remember being at university with a statistic about the Alpha course, it was something like, like 85%. You're talking about mm. the South American uh, kind of parachurch world, like we've done about Iran or in other countries mm. like the Middle East. But I remember just the, the quote about people in prison, like 80-something percent oh, yeah. of prisons that have and run the alpha course the irony is so thick mm-hmm. people in prison like, and again it's not that nobody's ever been saved but it's if they're not if 85% of British prisons are not receiving the full gospel the irony of freedom and truth is, is obvious I shouldn't need to spell it out so just to recap the problem with the alpha course is twofold that it is False, it's a false gospel in the sense that half a truth is no truth at all. It's not just light, it's, it's, deli- it's deliberately lacking. It's designed, it's written by people who are not stupid. You know, Nicky Gumbel is an, a former lawyer for Pete's sake. He knows how to write watertight text. So it's, it's that it's a false gospel, and secondly, that it's ecumenical. It's this thing of false unity rooted in Rome, rooted in Catholicism. And so I have no hesitation to reject it wholesale. And I can say that whilst also saying that I don't believe that God has never used it because I've seen and still see today the proof that he has used it. But that doesn't make it right. And that doesn't excuse the far-reaching implications. Uh, The the far-reaching implications. It's a mind blow and it is eye-opening and it's sobering. And as I said in the podcast... We were very. I was very strongly and directly led to expose this Losan heresy. There's no other way of putting it. It's a false covenant. Please listen to the podcast, and please pray with us every day for the faithfulness of God's people, and that the Lord would be merciful to bring people to see spiritual reality. Father, we just want to pray now for the nature of this conversation. We ask you to move mightily by your spirit. Lord, when we think of that hypothetical scenario of people turning to churches and so-called Christians who can't give Mm. an answer, Lord, what a tragic state. But Lord, we know you're merciful and we pray that there would be an uprooting like Jeremiah. Mm. That there would be an uprooting and a tearing down and and a waiting of four apparently negative verbs to two that are positive this destruction, this uprooting and bringing down of things that are false so that the true plantings of the Lord would result. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. And Lord, we just, we just pray for your people and we pray just for wisdom and discernment, Lord, and especially for people who are asking questions about these things and wondering and asking you we just pray that you would open people's eyes and help them to make the decisions that they need to make in order to be faithful Mm. we thank you for Mm. the way that you lead and the way that you gently move us along into things lord and help us to be able to see the things that are not true of you and to help others to see them too Mm. we pray these things in Mm. your name father Amen. amen amen amen